now uh, we're going to be uh, listening to uh, Ted, Ted von Prosvitz, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, the stone wall as a biotope, which I think is going to be very important for a lot of us who, who want to maintain our stone walls but have trouble getting funding uh, because uh, using the biodiversity as a strong argument is, is, is something that can really help when the conservation aspect is not taken seriously. So uh, yeah, this is going to be really interesting. Uh, and Ted, you are um, you work at the Natural History Museum of Gothenburg, uh, and uh, yeah, you're a, right. you're a snail and slug guy, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. and I, I also have an associate uh, professor at the Gotham University, so I teach conservation biology I see. as well. Right. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, so no, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I will try to give you some biological aspects on the stone walls. Lovely. Let's see if it functions here. Yeah. You're sharing your screen now, so now you, if you go to yes. your PowerPoint, I think it's gonna yes. look okay. Oh. If yes. you're in, if you're in the full screen mode of Zoom, you can press Escape to exit it temporarily. If it's if you uh, doesn't function. Who? <laughs> If if you click on click on my name, just one click and then press escape, do you does that help you to, to find your desktop? Nothing happens, but mm -hmm. uh oh, this works. Here we go, yeah. Can you see anything now? Yes. Okay. Now we, we see your slideshow and you can you just press Dolly there. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Let's start with some biological aspects on, on the stone wall as a habitat or a biotope. Uh, the importance from the biological view. What is a stone wall? Uh, that is a rhetorical question to you, but I usually uh, ask a question to my conservation students when I teach. It is a man-made boulder habitat in minor scale. And why are boulder habitats as such biologically important? Well, then let's begin with looking at a natural boulder habitat. Here's an example. It's a Sherrid Valley in the National Park of Söderåsen in southern of Sweden. And what we have here are boulder slopes with luxurious deciduous forests with a lot of habitat. They have such habitats, boulder habitats, have a very high uh, biological diversity. And they harbor many species sympatrically. That's, that means that they are there at the same time, simultaneously. And why is it so? Uh, that is because it is due to a physical structure. It's a complex structure of many microhabitats, uh, which concerns several factors. In the example, the aspect of a slope, a northern slope is uh, usually poorer than a southern slope. Moisture, water running over different parts of the slope makes the moisture conditions might be very difficult, different. The power of vegetation is very different. It might be almost closed forest to open shrubs and bushes or, or almost no vegetation at all. Which kind of vegetation do we have there? Which tree species? That is very important and I will explain why it is so. Uh, the ground litter in itself, the boulders, they collect the falling leaves. They do not float away with the water, but they remain there and decayed. And this, this structure forms many microhabitats, which are important for many invertebrates, small ground-living insects and other species. 
It is a difference in richness in the pH, in the calcium, depending on such things as what kind of trees, what kinds of leaves, what kind of bedrock. Uh, when we go from the macrocosmos, which is a boulder slope, into the microcosmos, the stone wall, this is, in my opinion, this is a boulder habitat, which is a, a, a microcosmos of a big one. Uh, and stone walls are man-made, they're artificial boulder habitats. And as such, they became uh, important for many organism groups. There's an example, yes, it's a churchyard at uh, Friel in Westergötland and a more simple wall uh, from Nullgården in Nes. They may look very different, but we have a comment, there are boulders or stones. Uh, similar habitats are also ruins. Here's the Rangnitzholmen in Bohuslän, Sweden. Uh, the remains of a fortress. And what can we find on or in a stone wall? Yeah, firstly, the vegetation. And here you should have perhaps another. I, I'm a zoologist. You should have a botanist that lecture about this because there are a huge diversity also in, in the flora. You have the flowering plants, grasses, ferns, mosses, and perhaps more uh, imp most important, the lichens. You might have nesting birds if there are holes big enough uh, between the stones. Snakes, lizards, frogs, toads, both for shelter and overwintering. It's not uncommon to find uh, overwintering toads within a stone wall. You have small mammals. They also search, uh, search refugee in there. Mice, and I don't only mean uh, I don't only mean uh, pest mice, but also rare species which make actually breed and build nests uh, inside the walls. And then we have a broad spectrum of uh, different invertebrates. Insects and also the pupa of butterflies and moths, they may overwinter within uh, the wall. There are beetles, there might be wasp nests, perhaps not that very nice, but they do build their nests inside walls. Other, uh, other hymenopteras, ants, etc., etc. Hiders, of course, they also search shelter and uh, place their cocoons within the walls. There are centipedes and uh, millipedes. There are woodlars, isopods, that are also quite common within the walls. And my own group on which I'm uh, doing research with land snakes and slugs, uh, you call it speciality malacology. And uh, which factors then influence the biodiversity on or in a stone wall? It's really the same factors in the macrocosmos as we saw in the boulder slope. We have the age and the continuity of the wall. Old and unaltered stone walls harbor more species. And that is perhaps not surprising. Uh, it is the same for boulder slopes. They used to be good refugia for species. Nowadays, uh, the modernized mechanized forestry do easily destroy even a, 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 boulder, a boulder slope. But uh, age and continuity, yes, of course. Geology, also of course. Of which rock is the wall? Is it limestone, which is the most favorable? The calcium source for snails? And they have the ability to absorb the calcium directly through the foot. So that is important. And it is also gives a general rise of a pH within the wall, which is favorable for many organisms. So limestone is the best sandstone, uh, somewhere in the middle, 
uh, Greystone, perhaps not so good uh, concerning geology and availability of calcium and pH. Uh, the stone wall is a shelter and it also stores heath. So it's favorable to live in there. And you can search shelter in harsh conditions or from a predator. Uh, the shading, that is uh, a question which might be discussed in some cases. Shaded stone walls, however, harbor more species. Uh, but I would say the best is a mixture of shaded and open parts. And this, I know, is much discussed. Uh, I myself had had discussions with the uh, Riksantikvarien the uh, Swedish National Antiques Office. They consider the, more, the walls should be open and no bushes, no trees. I say mixture because mixture means more habitats, more microhabitats, more species. Then we have a, another important question, that is the three species which shed their leaves on the wall. They in themselves create habitats out of the wall in the decaying leaves, the decay, different decaying uh, uh, stadia, uh, offer uh, conditions, living conditions, for different species. And here is another very important thing. Some tree species are better than others, I would say, because they accumulate calcium in the form of citrate in the leaves. The calcium citrate is easily soluble that the calcium ion is uh, separated easily and the, cal the calcium becomes available for snails to feed on. And it also increases the pH. Trees which uh, produce uh, calcium citrate uh, litter are lime, ash, maple, asp, and sallows. Uh, less favorable trees are, I would say, oak, birch, and beech. Uh, oak and beech, they may accumulate calcium in the leaves, but in that case, it is in the form of oxalate. And that is the binding between the ions is much more firm and has to be loosened by bacteria to get to give the calcium free and available. Birch uh, is not a good uh, accumulator at all. So usually fauna uh, the fauna is richer in the trees if it is formed by leaves uh, from the trees in the former group. It's poorer in uh, leaves from oak and beech. And it's the same if you look at the, 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 the situation in a natural habitat, in a natural forest. You have these differences in uh, diversity in the fauna and especially in land snails as they are dependent on getting calcium to build their shell. Uh, lichens are very important. Uh, there is often a very rich lichen fauna on a stone wall and this is important as source for many invertebrates, especially snails and slugs. They love feeding on lichens and many insects do so as well. There's a question of uh, how firm uh, the uh, wall should be. Uh, if it's just made up of low stones, which offer space, but it's, it's uh, not too packed, it allows more organisms access deep into the wall. Concrete, if it's uh, uh, the, the wall is built up with king concrete between the blocks, it enters, it blocks the entrance into the wall. But in, uh, and I would say generally it's negative. But uh, 
it may in a way be favorable for snails as they can extract calcium through their foot directly from the concrete. I give you just an example here of uh, a little, very beautiful uh, land snail living here uh, in stone walls, especially if they are of limestone. Uh, it's a, a medium sized, I would say, as most of those species, these species living in, in, in uh, stone walls are very small, about a centimeter long. You see, it's coiled in that way. If you note the, uh, a little, uh, the, the species name, it's perversa, which is given by Linnaeus himself. Uh, do you note what is perverse with this species? It's not easy to see if you don't have a, the very side for details, as Linnaeus himself says, but it is left coiled. The spiral is left coiled. And that is something very unusual among snails. Most of them are right cold. Uh, if you look at the form of it, it's elongated in a way, a high spire, a high shell. And to live in the, between the stones in a wall, this is very favorable. So the species you find here, uh, they are often elongated in this uh, matter or completely flat. So they can pass easily in and out between the stones in the wall. Uh, slugs. Slugs usually use stone walls as shelters, but slugs are uh, very sensitive to, to drought and they are usually only active at night or at rain. So they go into a stone wall and use it as a shelter. A few species are bound to boulder habitats and they also take uh, use the, the secondary habitat in a stone wall as their biotope. And that is the case with this uh, Lemania marginata, Triesnigelet, Swedish. Uh, this uh, question has been asked earlier, uh, when is the best time? Uh, when should you work with a, a stone wall with concern to fauna? Well, I say it's never really good but perhaps a little better in the winter than most of the organisms are in rest. But disturbed, they, would be, they will be anyway. So a proposal from me as a biologist, uh, if measures are taken uh, with a stone wall, a ruin, etc., take it in part, perhaps one part in the winter and one in the summer or autumn, or at two different years after another. Just a, a suggestion to enhance the, the possibilities for the organisms living in, in the wall to survive there. If we sum up this very short lecture on stone walls and biodiversity, they are important refugia for several organisms especially in a uniform agriculture area or a park. If we are in a part of a country where we have no boulder slopes, where we naturally have no boulder slopes, then this might be the only sites in which we find these organisms. So they are very important refugia. And these refugia may serve as recolonization centers for future spread. And I would say, Churchyard walls are important. I have investigated several hundred churchyard walls all over Sweden and also other parts of Europe. And they are, might be the only sites in which the species are still left. And from here, they might be able to recolonize. How would it take place? Well, if you talk of organisms like insects or millipedes or woodlays, and spiders, they have wings and they have legs. They can move actively, uh, actively and spread. But for snails and slugs, which have a very limited uh, active 
ability to, to disperse. They are in the need of other spectres as transporters, as vectors, and they foster themselves with their slime in uh, the fur of uh, mammals or in the feathers of birds, and in that case get transported. This very hazardous uh, way of spreading, an uncertain way of spreading, and you must land in, in the exactly right habitat for, for it to succeed. But this is something we should take think about as the stone walls of refugia, especially in agricultural areas. So, if I will, would like to give you something with you here. It is the last sentence here. Stormers do not only have the aesthetical, cultural, and historical values. All these are, of course, very high. But they also harbor high biological values. Biological values which are perhaps not detected or not known. So, I will say, take it into consideration. Perhaps do a biological survey of the world. I think it would show you a, a whole new world. Yes. So I say, do not forget the biological values. And that was it. Thank you for your attention. That was a great, very great point. I think we need to do more surveying, archaeological surveys, biological surveys, so we know yes. what we're working with, right? Yeah. This is, uh, yeah, this this was very, a very good talk, and uh, uh, I'd like to ask questions, but uh, we'll need to wait for them until the, the last panel session, unfortunately. So thank you very much, Ted. I hope you stick around. Uh, I'll do. <laughs> great.